What is up guys, Austin Nerd Show here with another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover Raw and Nitro from 1997. And this week we're looking at December 15th, 1997 and we're covering Raw number 238 and Nitro number 118. So we'll start with Raw first as usual and then move on to Nitro. And so for this Raw, a couple things that were point of interest. First, we'll go with the rating. It got a 2.7 rating, so nothing really special there compared to the past couple weeks and stuff. It's about average still so we're up at least compared to nowadays ratings are higher but it's not high compared to what it will be obviously and this show took place in Durham New Hampshire so that's I just thought was a weird place and so what I thought was interesting about this episode and it's kind of a monumental episode at least in my point of view for the WWF and it, first off to me at least first time I've noticed it it's the first time that they've used the WWF scratch logo and it's kind of made some point out so usually in the show like down in one of the bottom corners you'll see like the watermark of the show so you know it shows that it's you know wwf product or whatever and it shows the old like blockier um, letters well this week it was the first time it showed the wwf scratch logo and then we got some other parts of the show that are um significant stuff that goes into the attitude era and so we'll get to that once we get there so we already got pretty much going into the attitude era right now with this episode so as i said this is raw number 238 and so the show kicks off with michael cole bringing Bringing the Undertaker out for a interview, and so uh, so first thing I notice when Undertaker gets to the ring, and of course this, when the shows kick off, they do a whole bunch of pyro and everything, and then Undertaker has some pyro and stuff, I believe, and so when he comes in the ring and he stands on the stairs and he does the whole bringing the lights up thing, when he did that, and so the lights actually came on the arena, you could hardly see him because there was so much smoke in this arena from the pyro and his entrance and stuff, and so you could hardly see anything like for you couldn't see uh, Michael Cole in the ring or anything and of course as they're talking this it starts to clear out and everything but I just thought it was so funny like how much smoke there was in the arena but Michael Cole makes like the announcement thing that Undertaker will be facing Shawn Michaels at the Royal Rumble which of course is the next month pay-per-view for January and it will be for a casket match and so this is of course a famous match in Shawn Michaels history because it pretty much ended his career until he got fixed or whatever and better and came back so that's a very fun and interesting match I can't wait till we get to that part so in response to that Undertaker brings up, you know, that Sean has never has never been able to beat him one on one. So in all the matches had Shawn Michaels has had interference or someone else there to help him out. And so this will be a one on one match, and so Sean will not be able to beat him. And on top of that, it's a casket match, and Undertaker brings up that he's only lost one casket match in his career. And in that match, it took 10 other people to beat him. So that's the Royal Rumble match from 94, I believe it is, with Yokozuna, where all the, the like bad guys came from the back and helped throw Undertaker into the casket. And then Undertaker like ascended to the heavens or whatever they represented that as. And so as this goes on, eventually Kane and Paul Bear end up coming out to the ring. And Paul Bear ends up giving Undertaker one more chance to face Kane. He's like, you know, this is your last chance you face Kane or destruction and the WWF will continue on. And Undertaker, you know, is still refusing. So Kane ends up slapping Undertaker in the face for one time and then he starts to go for another time. But Undertaker catches his hand and then just lets it go. And then Undertaker turns around and leaves the ring, just leaving Paul Bear and Kane standing there in the ring. Then next up we got a match of Jerry Lawler taking on Taka Michinoku. So it's continuing on the Jerry Lawler, Brian Christopher, Taka feud going on right now. And so of course as the match starts Jerry the King Lawler just keeps making fun of Taka size and like you know making like short jokes and stuff to the camera and everything. So just as I said making fun of his size. And then Taka in the match at one point ends up hitting a springboard plancha onto Lawler on the outside. So that's kind of like one of Taka's sin signature moves because he does that like every single match. And eventually at one point they both both end up doing a double drop kick on each other so they both go for the drop kick but so they both kind of just hit each other in midair and no one really you know gets like neither move is actually effective on the other I don't know how else to describe it but at one point Lawler ends up going for his famous pile driver but instead like he hits it and he doesn't go for a pin right away and so he starts you know praning around and stuff and that allows Taka to eventually get back up and then he hits hit the Michinoku driver and starts to go for the pin but as the ref is counting Brian Christopher runs into the ring and stops the pin and because of that the ref throws out the match and so Taka wins by disqualification and so at one point Taka and Brian 
Christopher are fighting and then Lawler gets up and grabs a hold of Taka and is holding him. And Brian Christopher goes to hit a move on him, but Taka ends up ducking and Brian Christopher hits Jerry Lawler instead. So the whole misdirection type thing. And so that's the end of that match. Then next up we have the Nation of Domination coming out to the ring to cut a promo. And as they're coming out it's mentioned that The Rock is the IC champion or the Intercontinental champion. But Stone Cold still has a title. So apparently Stone Cold giving up the title was official I guess you could say from last week. Where he gave it up but he ended up taking it back. I just assume that means he took it back and so the rock's not the champion but they said the rock is the champion but just stone cold has the title and so the rock starts kind of promo and of course he's talking on and stuff and he goes like hand the microphone off to fruk or something and fruk starts to talk and mike and uh rocky pulls the microphone back away and continues talking so he keeps cutting off fruk building up the issues with them that's going on and then the rock ends up ordering stone cold to come out to the ring and to bring the his icy title so you know bring him his title and because that stone cold eventually comes out to the top of the ramp or the stage area to respond to the rock and he advises the rock that um, maybe later on tonight you should just be watching the monitor because you'll see where your title is and he ends up leaving and the rock says fine austin you have one hour to bring me the title and if you don't bring it by the end of the hour me and the nation will go in the back and search everywhere for you and bring you out here and beat you in front of everybody so just kind of trying to humiliate him and stuff and so they give austin one hour to do that we then go into our next match of Dude Love facing off with Road Dog. So, of course, he faced Billy Gunn last week. And so, it's Road Dog this week, and Billy Gunn is on commentary. And on commentary, while JR is talking to Billy Gunn, at one point mentions that they're the New Age Outlaws, as in JR does. He's like, You're just a couple of New Age Outlaws. And Billy Gunn's like, hey, I like that name. I think that's going to be our new name. So they officially got the name of the New Age Outlaws. And then at one point, Dude Love is thrown to the outside and Billy Gunn gets up from commentary and goes over and attacks him. And so he's just trying to get his hands on Dude Love while the ref is distracted by Road Dog. And at one point in the match, Road Dog ends up hitting Man or Dude Love with something. And Dude Love does what they call like flashing back or whatever to Mankind. And so he like turns into Mankind mode and he puts the Mandible Claw on Road Dog. And then once Road Dog is able to get out of the hole and stuff mankind just starts pulling on his hair and stuff or dude love does referencing him as mankind form but in the end dude love is able to hit the sweet shin music and the double arm ddt on road dog to get the win and soon after he gets the pin billy gun comes running in and tries to attack dude love and the outlaws are able to finally outnumber dude love and they you know beat him up a little and then they take off up the ramp fighting with dude love and so they start fighting up at the top of the ramp and they end up knocking him off the staging onto a table that's on the floor. And so at this point, their stage is really high up in there. It's got to be at least 10 feet high, if not higher. And so they knock him off. I think they end up like shoving a ref or somebody. I can't remember what they do exactly. But do love standing on the edge of the ramp. They shove, like I said, the ref or something. The ref knocks into him. He falls off the stage and tries to land through a table. But he kind of pretty much overshoots the table. And ends up falling straight onto the floor. And so that was just kind of a real nasty bump. And so there, of course, officials and everything out trying to take care of him and everything. And I think even like it shows, goes to commercial and comes back. And it says, you know, like during the commercial and it shows Road Dog and Billy Gunn like on the ring like, we're sorry, are you okay and everything? Which is just kind of stupid. But then I think they do end up like kicking him more or something. Then next up we got a match of Mark Henry taking on the Brooklyn Brawler. And so they're mentioning that this is Mark Henry's first match back because he's returned from an injury. I think they said an ankle injury or something. I don't remember which one. But of course with this it's pretty much just a squash squash match and Mark Henry ends up winning with a bear hug on Brooklyn Brawler. And then that goes into hour two and it kicks off with Vince McMahon coming out to confront Owen Hart for the stuff he's done from the DX pay-per-view in the past couple weeks. And Vince is talking about how Owen has been endangering the fans by coming through the crowd and that he o orders Owen Hart to come out. And so Owen Hart eventually does and he does come in through the crowd. And of course, that's not doesn't make Vince happy. And Owen uh, mentions that he's not sorry for what he's done and that he's decided that he's going to stay in the WWF and continue the fight for his, the Hart family and that his goal now is to make Shawn Michaels life a living hell and so after he gets done kind of the promo Vince asks for security to come out to the ring and to us escort Owen Hart to the back or wherever and so the security comes in and they like kind of stand around him and stuff and they all exit out through the crowd so I don't know why they went through the crowd when that's you know what the issue is but he had security around him at least so I don't know but so they end up going to the back somewhere 
Then next up, we got the match of the Sultan coming out with the Iron Sheik taking on Tom Brandy. So he's no longer Salvatore Sincere. He's just going by Tom Brandy now since Mark Mero told everyone his real name last week. And so overall, this match is pretty boring because the Sultan's not that entertaining and Tom Brandy's, you know, not a big name guy or anything. So he's not doing anything special. But the Sultan keeps doing like... I don't know how you describe it, like carefree pin. So like he'll do a move and go to pin Tom Brandy, but he'll just, you know, like put his foot on top of him or just like put one hand on the guy or something. And of course, Tom Brandy keeps kicking out every time he does that though. But at one point, Iron Sheik gets up on the apron and Tom Brandy goes over and starts dealing with him. And the Sultan comes up and tries to attack Brandy from behind, but Brandy notices and moves out of the way. And so the Sultan hits the Sheik. So once again, we got the whole misdirection thing. And Brand Tom Brandy ends up getting the roll up on the Sultan from that and gets the pin. And then Brandy starts celebrating in the ring and Mark Merrow comes in from behind and attacks Brandy and takes him out, ending that match off. Then next up, so I guess it's been an hour now, but the nation ends up coming back out for Stone Cold to come give him the rock back his title. And so they're standing in the ring ordering Stone Cold to come out. And all of a sudden you hear Stone Cold's voice and it goes over and he's up on the Titan Tron. And it shows that he's standing on a bridge late at night or sometime at night because it's super dark. So you have a light from the camera shining on him and stuff. And so this is the famous part where the ro Stone Cold takes a lot of stuff. And he's like, here, Rock, if you want your icy tile, you're going to need a couple things. First off, how about some scoot or some scooby gear? So he pulls up, you know, like goggles and a, like whatever those like, uh, I don't know what they call them. But they're like a giant straw that you use a snorkel. Is what I'm trying to think of. And then he takes actual scuba gear like a scuba tank and stuff and flippers and throws them out there. And he's like, and once you find it here, use the cell phone to call me. And so he throws the cell phone out there and then he's like, and then send me a pager or a message on the pager, which a pager is, of course, an old school device from the 90s that is super old now. And so he throws that out there, and then he's like, and here's the final thing, whatever, and he takes the IC title and throws it out into the water and tells The Rock to go get it. And so, of course, that's a pretty big segment, a part of WWF history, at least in the Attitude Era and stuff. And so that was a fun little part to see. So, of course, that makes The Rock mad, and they leave the ring going to the back. We have a little ad or commercial for the next week's Raw will be a special Christmas edition of Raw. So that's going to be kind of fun with Christmas stuff going on there. And then we get what I would say is another big major part of wrestling history. And Vince, it's a little like record, pre-recorded video thing. And it's Vince McMahon's Cure for the Common Show promo. And so in this promo, he brings up some stuff. That the show's going to start going for more entertainment and less just pure wrestling in the ring. And that he knows that fans are tired of having their intelligence insulted. And that there's not going to be any more good guys or bad guys or superheroes saying to take your vitamins and stuff. So referencing Hulk Hogan obviously. That Raw will be mount now or will now be more risque. And that viewer discretion is advised with the, you know, being at the time that they are. So any references, you know, with Raw and stuff will be more risque and more adult oriented where it's there's stuff like Saturday morning stuff, whatever, will still be friendly for kids and everything since the time wise during the showing. And so this is the big promo that pretty much signifies that it is now the attitude era that they're, like I said, going to more risque stuff and doing that. And that's why I said this is the biggest episode to me. If you want to put a date on the day that attitude era started, this would be it. So it'd be December 15th, 1997, because we get the introduction of the scratch logo and Vince's promo saying, you know, we're no longer going to insult your intelligence and stuff's going to be more risque. So we are firmly now into the Attitude Era. So this is what we've all been building up for. Then from there, we go into a match of Steve Blackman taking on Jose from the Los Bariquas. And so the Los Bariquas all come out and stuff, but they're sent to the back by the referee. And in the match, Steve Blackman is pretty much in control of the whole match. And he ends up getting the win with a German suplex on Jose. The next up, we have a DX promo, and they're backstage, and they're pretty much a stone, or Shawn Michaels and stuff's pretty much talking about, um, they discuss who will be Owen Hart, and so they play a rock, paper, scissors of who's going to get a face him, and Triple H ends up winning. So I assume this is, like, I know, I kind of remember next week's episode from when I watched it before of what happens, but I think this is kind of signifies of when it starts to transfer from Shawn Michaels facing off with Owen Hart to Triple H, because I know Triple H is the one that Owen Hart faces off a lot for, like, the European title and stuff like that, an IC title. 
And we eventually then go into our main event for the night, which is DX, of course, coming out with China, and they're taking on the Legion of Doom. And in this match, DX is cheating at every chance they can get, so anytime the ref is turned around or anything, or if the opposite Legion of Doom member is, like, trying to get in the ring and the ref will be trying to keep them out and stuff, DX will be double teaming the, uh, whichever... LOD member on the other side stuff so they're just kind of cheating whenever they can but overall just your standard tag match nothing really exciting goes on and eventually the New Age Outlaws end up coming out and they do a dis um, or cause a distraction for Hawk and Road Dog ends up chloroforming Hawk when he's on the outside because they like distract him and so he's on the outside apron waiting to be tagged in and stuff and so he gets down and comes over to them standing by the entrance ramp and I think Billy Gunn like t draws his attention and Road Dog comes up from behind with what they say is like chloroform on a rag and do that talk so they take Hawk out and so in the match while this is going on Animal is beating up both Sean and Triple H at the same time double like you know he's taking on both of them and China ends up coming in from behind and low blows Animal and so the Legion of Doom gets the win by disqualification because of China interfering and stuff and so they're all just beating up on the Legion of Doom and the outlaws end up throwing Hawk back into the ring and they end up pulling out a razor of shavers and they shave Hawk's head so they shave off his weird haircut. He has the reverse mohawk and so they end up shaving the like two side parts off of his head. And then the Outlaws and DX both all together powerbomb Animal through the announce table on the outside and then they get back in the ring and Billy Gunn does a leg drop on Hawk on the inside because obviously he's taken out by the chloroform and the shaved head and so Billy Gunn gets up and does the leg drop and then Sean gets up and does an elbow drop and so soon after that the Outlaws start leaving up the ramp and stuff they keep looking back and Shawn Michaels is just standing at the ring apron like looking up at them and he starts doing like the whole like saying you know mouthy not bad and like shaking his hand and stuff like oh they they're not that bad and stuff and uh then he starts doing the like hand on his mouth and stuff like he's thinking and stuff and so he's, you can kind of see what they're pointing and hinting, hinting at of possibly the New Age Outlaws joining DX which of course eventually happens but not until next year and after Shawn Michaels is gone. So overall, that was a pretty good and, like I said, monumental episode of Raw with all this stuff leading up. Because, as I said, we are now officially into the Attitude Era. So that is a big monumental episode for Raw. So we will now move into Nitro. And, of course, with Nitro, we're leading up to Starcade. I think we're still two weeks away. I'm not exactly sure on the exact date. I think it's December 28th or 9th. Yeah, 28th is when Starcade is. So we're about two weeks, I think a day under two weeks. And so this Nitro, which is Nitro 118, is a three-hour Nitro. So that was fun to go through. It actually didn't seem to take that long, but it's just so hard to get through three-hour shows. Like, if you watch Monday Night Raw every Monday now, you understand the feeling. But the Nitro drew a 4.0 rating, and this took place in Charlotte, North Carolina. So, of course, we're in Ric Flair country here. And so that has a part to do with many aspects of the show and stuff. And so again, this is from December 15th, 1997, if you were wondering. So the show kicks off with a replay of the sting attack from last week, of course, where the dummy dropped down through the ring. And then NW pulled him out of the ring and it was actually sting on the end of the string or whatever rope, whatever that dropped him from the ceiling and that whole attack and stuff. And so then we get into the actual show and it kicks off with all of the NWO coming out to the ring. And in the ring they cut their cutting to promos and Kurt Hennon mentions that he claims Flair will be retired after their match at Starcade. And of course with them being in Flair country that makes the whole uh, arena go crazy and stuff. And so he's just saying that he'll beat Flair at Starcade. And then Hogan starts talking and he's cutting a promo on Sting and he's a about Sting attacking him from behind and everything that Sting's just a coward and that tonight they will the whole NWO will be searching for him everywhere they can looking in all the like nooks and crannies trying to find Sting so we can't attack him from behind so eventually they end up leaving and we go to commercials and we have a lot of NWO commercials so the like black and white commercials tonight I didn't write them all down but I did these first two the first one was of the NWO beating up Larry Zbysko so that was the whole first commercial and then it immediately went to another NWO commercial and it was of them beating up on the Steiners so like I said pretty much any match of an NWO member or anything facing off against someone from WCW they had a commercial on it tonight. And our first match of the night is Vincent from the NWO taking on Ray Trailer. And this was a really quick match and Ray Trailer ended up getting the win with the Trailer Slam. 
And that leads into a, our first Nitro Girl segment, and then commentary reads a Nitro Party ad at the same point, too. And I think they said it's next week, maybe, that they announce the winner of the Nitro Party, where the Nitro Girls and Mean Gene and stuff will go to the winner's house or whatever and stuff to their party. And so we got that next week to look forward to. We then have a next match of Yuji Nagata coming out with Sonny Ono, and he's taking on Disco Inferno. And at one point in the match, Sonny Ono attacks Disco on the outside of the ring, usually as he does in every match that Yuji's in and Sonny's out there. He always attacks the opponent on the outside. But Disco is able to get the win with the chart buster on Nagata, retaining the US or the TV title I think he has. Then we got a match of Fit Finley taking on Dean Malenko. And of course this whole time Eddie Guerrero is on commentary again like he was last week. And of course while he's doing it he's just talking about crap about Dean Malenko the whole time as he was last week. Pretty much saying the same stuff again. And just how Dean Malenko is emotionless and stuff. But in the actual match, throughout the match, Fit Finley keeps doing a lot of very interesting moves. And they're just fun looking moves and stuff. But eventually Eddie Guerrero gets up from commentary and starts to go to the ring. And he's by doing that distracts Dean Malenko. Which allows Fit Finley to get the upper hand and hits the pile driver on Dean to get the win. So Finley wins there. And Fit, I think by the, what I've seen so far, Finley's becoming like one of my favorite people to watch on the show. He just does a lot of fun and interesting things. And he's such a weird p looking person. Like his like face looks weird. He has a mullet. He comes out wearing leather jacket that's on one side has a like football shoulder pad. And so it's just weird looking. And then he doesn't wear his knee pads on his knees. He has them down on like the front of his his boots and stuff and it just looks weird he's just a weird looking guy all together but he's so fun to watch in the ring the next up we got a cruiserweight match of La Parca and Psychosis taking on Rey Mysterio and Juventud so at one point in the match Psychosis tries to do a drop kick off the top rope and on Juventud but Juventud ends up moving and Psychosis drop kicks La Parca so again we're getting the whole going to attack your opponent and then they move and hitch what your partner and stuff that happened a lot on Raw and now it's happening on Nitro too and it's kind of cool then at one point Ray and Hoovy both do dives over the top rope at the same time you know in synchronicity or whatever they call it so they both do that at the exact same time again continuing on with their match from a couple weeks ago where they were both doing this like you know say like mirror moves where they're each doing the same move they did it this time but obviously i was partners now but in the end ray mysterio ends up hitting the hurricane rana on the parka on the outside and so that has them distract out there and juventude ends up hitting the 450 splash on psychosis in the ring to get the pin so ray and juventude win that match then next up we have Mean Gene bringing out Arn Anderson for a special ceremony, which I kind of didn't understand what was going on here. But in the ring we have a couple guys from the Charlotte Police Force and then Doug Gillinger, the head of security, and it said he was a retired person from the Charlotte Police Force and stuff. So they're just standing in the ring for whatever the ceremony is. And so Arn Anderson comes out and of course he just talks a little bit or whatever about four horsemen and stuff like that and then he brings out rick flair and of course the crowd goes crazy because as i said they're in flair's hometown and stuff and so they're just all going crazy and rick flair comes in and he presents the police chief with a check from wcw for fifteen thousand dollars and it's to go towards the memorial for fallen officers that was dedicated or whatever shown off earlier that day or something and so the check was to go to them to help pay for that memorial and so they take the check and thank everybody and they leave and so rick flair starts taking off like his suit jacket and stuff and goes now it's time to get the business of course he was all nice and cordial in that first part and so now he's taking his coat off and stuff and he's starting to woo a lot and go crazy and everything so he's like now it's time to get to business and so he calls out kurt henning to come out for a match tonight instead of waiting until starcade and he's just doing that and getting the crowd right up and everything we then go to a commercial comeback and it's now hour number two and mean gene's still in the ring and he brings out jj Dillon to talk to him and jj brings up that eric is in the back trying to get out of a match and so sort of response eric bischoff comes out to respond back to jj and he's bringing up that it isn't fair and you know because he's not a wrestler and stuff and so so much can't be put on line for him you know who's not a wrestler going against a legendary wrestler of larry zabisco and eric you know ends up going you know what fine if if we're gonna have this match i want my rules and that means that punches, kicks, and knockouts are must be allowed in the match. And JJ is like, you know what? I agree to that. And since Larry Zabisco is an actual wrestler, where because you know Eric Bischoff is like a martial artist and stuff, or whatever, does karate and everything. That's why he wants punches and kicks and stuff. So Jay is like, well, since Zabisco is a wrestler, I'm gonna also add submissions into the match to be allowed, which you know submissions are always allowed. 
and punches and kicks are allowed but not like open hand punches and stuff but i guess they are now and i don't know it's just like they're just adding stuff that's already been always allowed and stuff but and so eric bischoff agrees to that and so they i guess the match is now maybe official for once since eric bischoff keeps going back on wanting more stuff added on to it or whatever from there we have a Nitro Girls segment that then leads into Scott Hall taking on Chris Jericho. And so Scott Hall once again comes out and he takes the survey and this time there are massive cheers for WCW and massive boos for NWO but he still says oh that's another win for NWO even though you know hardly anyone was cheering for NWO. And so Chris Jericho then eventually comes out and so as he's up on the ring apron Scott Hall runs over and tries to attack him but Jericho's able to duck it and then starts uh, hitting a bunch of moves and he hits it like a bunch of it or a couple different finishers and stuff and each time he goes for the pin but he's not able to get it on scott hall then at one point scott hall which then gets the upper hand ends up hitting the choke slam on jericho and then of course mocks the giant again like lumbering around the ring like frankenstein or whatever would do and then hall ends up getting the win with the outsider's edge over jericho then we get a nitro party video from central michigan university and so i thought this video was kind of interesting compared to most because usually if it's at a university it's in like a frat house or something but this time it's in like a lecture hall room so you know the big rooms with the with the stared seats and everything and they have a big projector up on the wall and everything and uh, it has nitro running and they have cheerleaders and everything going on and so it's just a big giant party and I, they must have got a deal worked out with the school or something to obviously use the lecture room but so i thought that was kind of cool Next up, we go to a match of Ming coming out with Jimmy Hart, and he's supposed to take on Steve McMichael. And so they start playing his music, and he doesn't come out. So the camera eventually goes to the back, and he's been Steve McMichael's has been laid out on the ground by Goldberg. And so J.J. Dillon's back there, and he's yelling at Goldberg. He's like, fine, you have to go out there and face Ming. So Goldberg starts walking from the back out to the ring. And as he's walking down the ring, like he's or down the entrance, and he's probably about halfway down or close to the ring or something, Steve McMichaels gets, comes running out through the entrance and attacks Goldberg from behind. And so they start fighting out the entrance way. And so no match actually happens because Mongo and Goldberg are just fighting the whole time. Then that goes into a Nitro Girls dance segment, and then into Conan and Scott Nor Norton coming out with Vincent, then they're taking on the Steiner Brothers coming out with Ted DiBiase. And of course, with, when you have Scott Norton and then the Steiner Brothers, is pretty much just like a big power match, like so they're both trying to use giant power moves and outpower each other. But at one point in the match, the Steiners end up setting up for the Steiner Bulldog. But as they're doing that, Vincent comes in and attacks Scott Steiner, dropping whichever Scott Norton or Conan, he, I assume it was probably Conan, that he had up. And so that draws a disqualification. So obviously the Steiners end up winning by DQ. And that NWO comes in and, and so the guys just get back in the ring. And so the NWO members are outnumbering the Steiners, obviously, until Ray Trailer comes running out and he helps the Steiners and ends up kicking the NWO out of the ring. And the Steiners and Ray Trailer are standing tall in the ring then next up we got the match of booker t taking on macho man randy savage coming out with elizabeth and so as, as they started to play macho man's music miss elizabeth ended up coming out and she's just standing on top of the ramp and it takes for macho man forever to come out to the ring so i don't know what was going on there why it was taking him so long but i was like is something going on has he been attacked in the back or something and he's not coming out either but he eventually did. So in the match, Booker T at one point ends up hitting the Harlem sidekick, which is kind of one of his like finishing moves. But Macho Man rolls out of the ring instead. And so they fight on the outside quite a bit again. Another Macho Man match where they're fighting on the outside a lot. And at one point, Macho Man grab picks up like a plastic chair. And I don't know how to describe the chairs. It's like the chairs I know we'd always have in like elementary school and stuff. They're just like, you know, plastic chairs with metal legs. And the backs usually have like a hole in them and stuff. And they're just like a somewhat hard plastic. But he just picks that up and ends up hitting Booker in the back with it. And then he throws Booker T into the ring steps. And then the first of many that happened tonight, which I'm quite surprised. But a fan tries to get into the ring. And I think Macho Man ends up kicking him or something like that. But I know uh, the fan like never actually makes it into the ring and stuff. But then back in the match, Booker T ends up hitting a drop kick on Macho Man. And Macho Man falls back into the ref referee so that kind of like knocks the referee out after that macho man gets back up and booker t ends up hitting him with the scissor kicks and then starts to go up to the top rope to do some move but elizabeth gets up on the apron and grabs a hold of booker's foot trying to keep him from jumping
jumping off the top rope. And at this point, Macho Man's able to get up and he goes over and knocks Booker T off the top rope onto the outside. Then he goes and gets him and throws him back in the ring. And Macho Man goes up and hits an elbow drop on him. And at this point, Elizabeth's over with the ref like trying to wake him up and get his attention and stuff again. And Macho Man pins him and the ref is there to count to three. So Macho Man wins the match beating Booker T. And then that will lead us into hour number three. So again, this is a three-hour Nitro. And it kicks off with a Nitro Girl segment that then goes into the match of Chris Benoit taking, or supposed to be taking on Raven once again. But I don't know what's going on, but Raven's not there again. Like, he's not been there for the past couple weeks. I don't know what's going on. If there's, you know, contract issues or something going on there. I don't know. But Scotty Riggs end up taking Raven's place instead. And so in the match, Benoit's pretty much in control of the entire match. And he ends up hitting a flying headbutt. But he's too preoccupied, like, after he said, but instead of going for a pin or any thing else he's occupied with the flock and is over at the ropes like yelling out at them and stuff and that allows Scotty Riggs to kind of fight back and stuff but Chris Benoit is able to get the upper hand again and gets the cross face on Riggs for the win and Benoit grabs a promo and he starts uh calling out Raven and stuff and he's I forget what he says quote the crippler nevermore or something like that instead of Raven and then he run and just launches himself over the railing onto the flock attacking them and the flock starts fighting back of course because they have much more numbers and stuff and so they're able to beat him up and get him back into the ring and Saturn ends up putting on the rings of Saturn of him before they cut away from the match. Then next up we have Mean Gene out once again to talk with J.J. Dillon and J.J. mentions that Eric's just in the back throwing a tan- temper tantrum still and J.J.'s like I don't know what to do I've agreed to every, every stipulation he's brought up and so I don't know what else to do and so Eric Bischoff comes out and Eric questions well one last thing who's going to be the ref for this match and Eric brings up how about Kevin Nash will be the ref or maybe six or something and he's like you know bringing all these guys and J.J.'s like you know what how about I pick one of your guys to be the referee for this match and Eric's like you're gonna pick one of my guys one of the NWM members like JJ's like yes I'll pick one of them and Eric's like fine you've got the deal and so they make the match whatever and so JJ's like and so here's your guy and he brings out Bret Hart so this is the first time Bret Hart is on Nitro so again another monumental part of a show with this time for Nitro with Bret Hart being the first time he's shown in the WCW and so, of course, as he's walking to the ring and stuff, Eric Bischoff's so happy and he's, like, got a big smile on his face and just um, happy that that was the choice. And so in the ring, Brett's on the mic and he's like, you know, I agree. He pretty much agrees to be the ref of the match. But he tells Eric Bischoff that not to look for me for any help. I know what it's like to be screwed by a referee. And so he's pretty much telling Eric Bischoff, you're on your own. You know, I'm not helping you or anything. And, of course, that ups- upsets Eric Bischoff. And so he's kind of just signifying, you know, that Bret Hart's not with the NWO, even though NWO has been claiming that he is. But it's kind of helps signifying that it's not. So, but anyways, that upsets Eric Bischoff. And Eric Bischoff starts going like, Brett, Brett, Brett. And he just keeps saying Brett a lot. And he goes, and he gets back over to the mic. And he's like, if that's your choice, remember, $7.5 million a year, weekends off, Brett. Brett and he just keeps saying that like reminding him you know I'm paying you all this money you're gonna do what I want you to do and stuff and he ends up just leaving after that and stuff ending that segment. Then we go to commercial and come back and Mean Gene's still out in the ring. So Mean Gene's just like doing the whole show pretty much. And this time he calls out Lex L- for Lex Luger to come out to be interviewed. But instead Buff Bagwell ends up coming out. And Buff Bagwell's in the ring. <laughs> he's talking and he's making fun of Lex Luger. And he brings up that Luger that he can't, won't, and never will be Buff. And eventually Lex Luger comes out to respond to Buff Bagwell. And Luger says, you know, while you were out here saying all your stuff or whatever, I was in the back asking for a match. And you know what? It was granted. So we're going to have a match right here. And Buff's like, you can't do that. You don't even have a ref for anything. And so a ref ends up coming out. I think it's Nick Patrick ends up coming out. And he's like, we've got it all here. And so Buff's trying to uh, make more excuses. He's like, you know, I'm like a Ferrari or something like that. You can't just start me up and go. I've got to be warmed up and everything. And Luger's like, oh, you need to be warmed up. How about this? And he ends up slapping Buff in the face. And so, of course, that pisses Buff off. And so they eventually have the match. And so then that's next of Buff Bagwell taking on Lex Luger. So in the match, Lex Luger pretty much dominates the whole match. Um, at one point he starts to go for the torture rack, but Vincent and Scott Norton end up running out. So that causes like kind of a distraction or something. But Lex Luger is able to clothesline Buff Bagwell over the top rope. And apparently at this point in time, that's a just calls for disqualification. So Buff Bagwell ends up winning because he got knocked over the top rope, which I know that was a stipulation a few years ago in WCW, like when it was under Bill Watts and stuff, because it's part of like the NWA rules or whatever, or there used to be like an NWA rule. And so with Bill Watts, 
thought that he like introduced that rule back again, but I thought since Eric Bischoff took off he or took over the coming, he eliminated that. But apparently, he was a part of this match for some reason, and so Buff ended up getting the win by disqualification. Then next up, we get the match of Kurt Henning taking on Ric Flair. And so Kurt comes out first and he starts cutting a promo. And I don't know why, but he starts challenging anyone in the crowd to come in and face him. And I don't know exactly why he was doing it because obviously no one was coming in and stuff. But he eventually does accept Ric Flair's challenge for a match tonight. And so we go, I think, like to a commercial or something, come back, and Ric Flair comes out to the ring. And so as soon as Flair hits the ring, he just starts attacking Kurt Henning immediately. But soon as the match, like, soon after the match started, like, within a minute or so, all of the NWO comes running out, and they start attacking Ric Flair. And so while this is going on, Henning attacks Flair with the U.S. title, and then he starts attacking Flair's leg until in the WCW guys come running out of DDP, the Steiner brothers, and Lex Luger. So they all come running out to help Ric Flair, and so they're fighting off the NWO and fighting him out of the ring and everything. And so the NWO, like, leaves, and Ric Flair is helped to the back by all of the WCW guys, or by the Steiners and Lex Luger. They, like, carry him to the back like and he's of course selling his leg injury and stuff as they're carrying him out and so that leaves DDP in the ring and so he calls Kurt Henning to come back out and face him right now and while this is going on while he's calling him for him to come back out and stuff to try and get revenge for Flair two more fans try to get into the ring and the ref ends up attacking one of them because one doesn't make it to the ring but the other one like gets up in the ring like on the mat and stuff but he doesn't actually get up or anything and the ref start like kicks him in the face and then starts putting like a headlock on him and stuff and the guys like went lips I don't know if like the kick to his face or whatever knocked him out or whatever but then eventually Eventually security comes over and takes him out. And then in response to DDP calling out Henning, all of the NWO comes back out to the ring, led by Hulk Hogan and stuff. And so at this point, the commentary mentioned that DDP saw all of the NWO coming. So he's left the ring and it shows DDP going up the um, steps in the crowd and stuff, trying to like get out of there and stuff. So Hogan's in the ring and he's kind of promo on Sting. And so he's doing that and the lights end up going out and they come back on and it shows a Sting. There's like a spotlight up on Sting and he's up in the rafters and then eventually the lights end up coming back on. And now, as Hogan's yelling at Sting to come down and face him, another fan tries to get into the ring. So we've had four fans try and get into the ring tonight. So I don't know if it's because of the whole, you know, being in Flair country and it's the NWO trying to, you know, get back at the NWO for Ric Flair and stuff like that. Or the Four Horsemen or what. But they just keep trying to get in the ring. But eventually the lights end up going out again and coming back on. And this time there's a Sting standing up on the entrance ramp. Or should I say, like, above the entrance, so, like, where the guys walk out up above that, there's someone standing up on the Nitro logo up there. So it's kind of weird that there's someone up there. But it shows them up there, and, of course, Hogan's yelling at Sting to come, to get down and come out to the ring and stuff. And eventually it's, like, showing Hogan in the ring, and then it goes back, and you don't see the purse up there anymore, but uh, Sting actually comes walking down the ramp, th or through the entrance down the ramp, and then the show fades to black before Sting ever gets to the ring or anything. So I don't know exactly what happens there, so I assume next week we'll pick up with that and it'll show like what happened last week after we went off the air or something like that so three hours and they still didn't get all the actual like stuff and although they probably did that on purpose but again that was also a pretty interesting episode of nitro again it was three hours so that took forever but with the whole stuff of the nwo the eric bischoff stuff the Ric Flair stuff and everything. It was overall pretty interesting and kept it together. Of course, we got, like I said, Bret Hart coming in. So we have two big parts on each show, Bret Hart and WCW, and the introduction of the official Attitude Era on Raw. So once again, both were really fun episodes. I hope you enjoy. Um, don't forget you can listen to this in podcast form on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever you want to call it. You can subscribe and download there. You can also listen to it through SoundCloud on the website there. Or you can listen through it through YouTube. And don't forget if you're there to leave any comments you have down below if you enjoy or have any questions or anything. Or don't forget to subscribe there to never miss out a new episode every single week. That's going to be it for the show this week. I hope you enjoyed going back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and listening and checking out these two episodes of Raw and Nitro. But I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next week.